this will be wonderful, and I'm grateful to be together. My name is Anthony Sweat, uh, and I'm uh, in Church History and Doctrine here at BYU. I've been asked to moderate this session. The title of this one is uh, Pushing Back Municipal Efforts to Strength to Safeguard Religious Liberty in Nauvoo. And we get to hear from Garrett Dirkmont, and he's going to be presenting first on Too Long Trample On to Be Celebrated Religious Bigotry in the Latter-day Saint Refusal to Celebrate Independence Day. Uh, Garrett J. Dirkmont is an associate professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. He received his PhD from the University of uh, Colorado in 2010, where he studied 19th century American expansionism and foreign relations. Um, Garrett has worked on the Joe Smith Papers. Uh, he's published award-winning books like From Darkness Unto Light. He's done groundbreaking research uh, on uh, the uh, sermons of Brigham Young. He's just a wonderful scholar and, 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 a, and a dear friend of mine. I'm, I'm just we're privileged to be able to have him today. All right, well... First, let me apologize, Tony, that you probably had to stop, take a breath, get a drink for the title. Um, I, I, you know, when you start studying 19th century history, one of the things that's really profound to you is just how uh, writers of the era would, would r literally include the entire purpose of the book in their title, and, uh, which is great because you always knew what the book was about. And uh, I guess the, the longer I've, I've been a historian, I, I'm becoming what I'm studying because because Tony had to take two breaths to get the title out. I apologize to the conference presenters, whoever typed up the program. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, maybe it's because I've been reading too much Mormonism Unveiled, you know. <laughs> we always call it Mormonism Unveiled, but the reality is the real title of the book is Mormonism Unveiled, or that faithful account of that singular imposition and delusion from its rise to its present time with sketches of the characters, the propagators, the full detail of the manner in which the famous Golden Bible was brought before the world to which are added inquiries of the probability of the historical part of said Bible was written by Solomon Spalding more than 20 years ago and intended by him to have been published as a romance is the actual title of the book. So if you're going to cite it and quote it, you need to be accurate. Um, and so, you know, maybe in my efforts to try to let you know what this was about, I went a little, a little too far. Um, I, probably not exactly the most uh, um, enticing uh, uh, topic either, I would guess, that many people are like, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Well, uh, the Latter-day Saints, of course, have, as, as this conference demonstrates and will continue to demonstrate, have a, have a fraught relationship, a peculiar relationship uh, with uh, the United States government in, in its history, as well as local governments and with American culture. And... Um, for the Latter-day Saints uh, there in Joseph Smith's era, the, their patriotism was something that they were actually quite proud of. Um, they believed themselves to be the, the truest hearted American citizens. Now this of course is gonna place them in a pretty, a pretty rough juxtaposition when the very government that they feel themselves to be the best citizens of seems to be the problem or at least completely unwilling. I mean, over the course of time, the governments, both state and federal, are at best going to be utterly apathetic to the violence that's taking place against them, and at worst, the perpetrators of that violence, and shielding those who commit that violence. And so, um, in 1841, you see that though they've had horrendous experiences in Missouri, though Joseph has already uh, met with President Van Buren and, and had the president, in whatever way he said it, say, I don't think I'm going to help you. Um, uh, the, the reality is Latter-day Saints still demonstrated their public display of patriotism every 4th of July. And this 1841 4th of July celebration is replete with cannons firing, with the Manavu Legion marching up and down there, state representatives there giving speeches, and Joseph himself is going to give a speech. He strongly testified of the, his regard for our national welfare and his willingness to lay down his life in defense of his country. And close with these remarkable words, I would ask no greater boon than to lay down my life for my country. However, this love, uh, I guess like so many, is very unrequited, or at least as far as Latter-day Saints are concerned. Uh, as the years progress, as the increasing intolerance in Illinois becomes apparent, uh, Joseph, in desperation, is going to uh, 
reach out to the various presidential candidates, uh, as you've, you've heard in other sessions, asking what they would do for the Latter-day Saints were, uh, he, were they elected a president. And uh, men that he had put his hopes in, like Henry Clay, are going to write back to him and say, you know, again, essentially, your, your cause is just that I can do nothing for you. Um, this will cause Joseph to do two things. First, he's going to declare himself to be a presidential candidate, not because he thinks he's going to win, but because like all third-party candidates in American history, it's a way to bring attention to a cause, especially a cause of a suffering minority, which is part of what he talks about. But much more long-lasting, Joseph makes the decision that the Latter-day Saints can no longer expect to receive any kind of justice or peace inside the borders of the United States. And so he will, as you have here from his journal, I instructed the 12 to send out a delegation to investigate the locations of California. And the scribes started right Mexico there, but they scribbled out because California is Mexico. But um, Oregon to find a good location where we can remove after the temple is completed and build a city in a day and have a government our own in a healthy climate. So the idea that they would need to leave the United States is something that Joseph has already decided prior to the explosion of violence that's going to end up taking his own life. So you can only imagine uh, that in the aftermath of Joseph's murder, the things that were pushing that along, especially among the leadership of the church, but also among their general members, is, is just more, uh, it, it's, it's reiterated. It is stamped as an absolute. This is not the first time that they've dealt with um, violence. It's not the first time that they had state, local, and even federal governments refuse to intervene. For a very brief time after the murder of Joseph Smith, uh, Governor Ford, as if he was trying to backtrack a little bit, uh, came out greatly in favor, trying to protect the saints. But that, that withers away pretty quickly. By the end of the year, the Illinois legislature has decided that the real problem with the Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo is that Nauvoo has a city charter at all. Um, that the fact that they have a Nauvoo Legion is what's really causing the problem. The only reason why people are, 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 are threatening to exterminate them is they're just so afraid of the Nauvoo Legion, they can't possibly live in peace thinking that the Nauvoo Legion exists. Um, this is obviously put to a lie as the Nauvoo, Legion, uh, as the Nauvoo Charter is going to be re repealed in January of 1845, leaving the essentially second largest city in Illinois no longer a city. Uh, they don't have the ability to tax, they don't have the ability to have a police force, they don't have the ability to function as any other city government, and they have to then rely upon uh, the county government. These things and increasing threats from other uh, violence only spurs the, the, uh, the reality of, of Brigham Young and other church leaders to continue to look for um, uh, the possibility of getting out of the country, to, to, to plan for it. Now, they aren't going uh, uh, far afield from Joseph in, in that Joseph had already planned for this. They already were negotiating with the Republic of Texas to move there. They'd already planned on sending scouts out. But after Joseph's murder and the aftermath, the reality is that, that, that they need to get out of the country. As Brigham Young will say, the nation has severed us from them in every respect and made us a distinct nation just as much as the Lamanites and is my prayer that we may soon find a place where we can have a home and live in peace according to the law of God. I hope to find a place where no self-righteous neighbors can say that we are obnoxious to them. Um, he, he's going to reiterate that. The Gentiles have rejected the gospel. They've killed the prophets. Those who have not taken an active part in the murders all rejoice in it and say amen to it. He's going to go further to say that if we can get 100 miles beyond the jurisdiction of the United States, we are safe for the present. He, his plan is to get out. Um, John Taylor, who experiences this, also uh, is more than willing to share his peace of mind. If you know anything about John Taylor, he is not shy to tell you what he thinks. So let me apologize for... He wasn't President Taylor at the time. Uh, as I read here... Um, in regard to the situation of the world as it now exists, I don't care a damn, because they are as corrupt as the devil. We have no benefit from the laws of the land, and the only reason they don't cut our throats is because they dare not. We know that we have no more justice here than we could have at the gates of hell, and the only thing we've got to do is to take care of ourselves. We've been excluded from our rights as other citizens. We've been, we have a right to make a law for ourselves. Other people recognize this as well, um, much, uh, much of it negatively, 
Here one New York newspaper talking about the Mormons in the mid-1845. It is not very likely that these creatures can ever muster strength enough to do anything but very alarming to the peace of the whole country. But they are likely enough to make mischief to their nearer neighbors, and we are ourselves of the opinion that we will never rest, that they will never rest quiet till they commit some act, uh, over act of outrage. Formidable enough to earn themselves a sound thrashing by a military force. The only force probably that will even have much effect upon them, for they seem to entertain very loose notions on everything in the shape of merely civil and legal authority. They are a band of, of ignorant fanatics like these Mormons ought to be well watched and not permitted to gather too dangerous ahead in the very midst of a more rational and civilized society. We have no doubt that they have in some instances been misused by those who surround them. But making the best estimate that can be made of their character, they are a disgusting and troublesome band of absurd fanatics. And we do not wonder at them feeling that it is, in, that it is enlisted against them by their neighbors. So the reality is some people even recognize that they're being mistreated. It's hard not to recognize that when houses are being burned down and people are being killed. But as so often happens with persecuted minority groups, the response is, well, they, yeah, but they kind of deserve that. If you knew that, if you knew what they'd done, then you'd understand why people react that way. Uh, Minor Deming, who will, uh, is the sheriff of uh, the county at the time, in July of 1845, writes to his parents. This is a private letter. He's writing to them. This isn't for his political purposes. The mob party that murdered the Smiths in jail tried and hoped to burn out and expel the Mormon population of the county, amounting to twelve or 15,000 people. With their friends and its political influences, makes a violent, desperate, and lawless faction. These men have declared that they will not regard law, so they beat, threaten, insult, and injure whom they choose with impunity. This is a non-Latter-day Saint giving that commentary. And so when the 4th of July rolled around, rather than the cannons and guns that were fired off normally in the parades and celebration, as George A. Smith will write, um, if I had more time, we could really spend some time if we zoomed in close. Look at George A. Smith's neck beard. I mean, that is... Look. It, it is incredible. I mean, it is. Let me, I, I, look how low it is. It's under his Adam. Anyway, anyway uh, if you don't remember anything from this, George Smith's neck beard. But um, he records in, in, his, in, his, in his journal that there was no noise of fi or firing of guns in the city on the 4th of July, unlike all of the others. And perhaps one of our best uh, uh, evidences of this deliberate decision that they were not going to endorse and celebrate the 4th of July comes from a young uh, married Latter-day Saint woman, Irene Haskell. She wrote to her parents who were in Massachusetts, the 4th of July has just passed. I suppose there were balls, tea parties, and the like in the East, but here there was nothing of the kind. The Mormons think the liberty and independence of the United States has been too long trampled upon to be celebrated. Or as Zina Jacobs would say, when I cast my eye about, what do I behold? Every brother armed with his gun upon his shoulder to protect his family and brethren from the violence of the furious mob who are now burning all that falls into their way round about the country. Ah, liberty thou art fled when the wicked rule the people mourn. And so in the Nauvoo neighbor, John Taylor, the same John Taylor who was not shy of giving his opinion, said so many actions have been perpetrated against the Latter-day Saints over the past 15 years that independence, or it has been commonly called the 4th of July, had a very few charms as a nation's birthday or patriotic holiday. The extermination from Missouri, the assassination at Carthage of Joseph and Hiram, with impunity, the repeal of our city charter by might to rob us of right, gave the noise of shouting and the firing of cannon throughout the nation the appearance of a great gun that had been fired for joy a long while ago, but now is silent. We've entered into the 70th year of liberty or Republican administration and government, but from the uh, intestine commotions and divisions, religious and political, we may safely quote the psalmist's words. He's going to drop down here. The United States is in comparison a poor, weak old man in his 70th year, adjusting his spectacles to read the fires, murders, storms, and calamities with which a just God is vexing his prodigal now. He's going to uh, receive some pushback from this as... Other newspapers, antagonistic newspapers, learned that the Latter-day Saints didn't celebrate the 4th of July as good patriotic Americans should have. Some, like the St. Louis New Era. We're informed by a gentleman who spent the birthday of American independence in that city of fanatics that no notice was taken of it whatsoever. 
The usual business of the place was carried on without interruption. A large number of persons were at work on their holy temple on that day, and our informant inquired of some of the principal ones why the day was not observed. Their reply was that they considered this no land of freedom, but of despotism. And besides that, they had no part or lot in the government. Other newspapers, I won't go over all of them for time's sake, but they all uh, outside attack. And you can see the problem where the Latter-day Saints are at. How is it that you can protest the injustices that are being put against you? As a hated and a despised minority group that they are, if you simply celebrate the 4th of July as giving you this great, wonderful independence, which it is not affording you, well, then you suggest to people that the problems you have aren't really that big of problems. But if you protest, even in a silent protest, one that's publicly visible, well, then the response is, see, I told you they weren't good Americans. I told you that they were a problem. See, what person would not celebrate the Independence Day? But on this day in 1845, Latter-day Saints made a very deliberate decision that they were not going to celebrate the nation's independence. After these criticisms came in, John Taylor's going to, you know, he's going to take up the pen again, and, and, and I will, I'll leave you with this to give Jeff more time to clean up all my messes. But um, the above quills of the inner man pricking through the hypocrite's hides made the saints feel all over. After having been robbed of one or two millions of dollars of worth of property, been murdered and exterminated by executive authority from the independent Republic of Missouri, after having had a city charter either given or taken surreptitiously, besides the martyrdom of two of their best men, while under the plighted faith of the state, yea, verily, the celebration of the 4th of July heretofore more than any other people, and throughout the Union except Nauvoo, the past anniversary by the Mormons is all chaff. Stealthily forcing our guns from us in Missouri, taking the state arms and cannon from us in Illinois, so that the pimps of the new era and the Gazette and those in juxtaposition their mind, we might celebrate the 4th of July with pop guns. Vote as they say for nabobs to rule over us, and please to the last we crop the flowing food and lick the hand just raised to shed our blood, crying, Freedom, freedom! Oh, the blessings of liberty! If you lynch men to death in Vicksburg for gambling, or burn a Negro alive in St. Louis, or massacre men for being Catholics and foreigners in Philadelphia, it is all in the way of independence. Here, Taylor links the abuse that other hated minority groups suffer at the hands of the, the blessed liberty of the United States, and, and gives the social commentary that it's wonderful if you happen to be in the majority to be able to celebrate independence. But what do you do when you are the hated minority? And it's in that realm that we have to be most cognizant when we are thinking about religious liberty today. We are thinking about liberty of conscience. If there's no way for someone to protest the way that they have been treated, well, then that makes that person sharing their grievance is pretty difficult. So I will close with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey and Garrett. Those were, thank you for sharing your research and your just masterful insights and blessing our lives with your knowledge. Uh, and for ending on time, both of you. Good job. We have 15 minutes for questions. Um, uh, to Garrett and Jeffrey, and if I could ask a favor, uh, please ask a question and not make a presentation yourself in your question. There is a Provo Municipal Ordinance that we don't want to levy against you that says that at these conferences you cannot ask a question that lasts longer than a minute, otherwise it's a presentation itself, okay? So uh, we're happy to have questions. If you want to come up, I'll have a roving mic that I'll, I'll take around for you. Um. <coughs> So now I'm just super curious, like, how did we get back to celebrating the 4th of July? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the question of how we get back to celebrating, obviously, uh, the, the history of Latter-day Saints and United States relationship is, is very problematic, and it is... Uh, another 4th of July celebration in 1851 that precipitates 
the problems that lead to the runaway officials in Utah Territory as well. It's a 4th of July celebration, which is half-hearted, followed up by a 24th of July celebration that is allowing uh, the government to know that wrongs have been committed. I think for the Latter-day Saints, the way that, that they feel, uh, which with whatever level of justification you want to give them, I mean, uh, a good example from what I presented, that, that Sheriff Minor Deming, he will be assaulted uh, in the courthouse by a, an, an anti-Mormon, and in the midst of that struggle, fighting, he finally pulls his gun and shoots the guy. Well, the antagonists of the, the Mormons in the county not only have him arrested for attempted murder, his bail is set at $5,000, which is more than the bail of all of the people accused of killing Joseph and Iron Smith. So I think for them, they feel like the, they, they are constantly facing this, this, this in, inward struggle with themselves, that they're all Americans, and that they think that the Constitution's inspired by God, and that the problem is it's just the leaders of the government that aren't following it. But over the course of time, you know, by the time you get into the, the anti-polygamy legislation, the, they become well aware that there, you know, there isn't a Mormon battalion big enough there isn't a, a, a lots company of, of troops that go off in the Civil War. There isn't, there isn't a, a, a cannon large enough to celebrate the 4th of July that will cause other Americans to view them as being good patriotic citizens. So, I mean, really, it's not until the, the 20th century that Latter-day Saints are going to start to develop as part of their persona a... Uh, in America anyway, a, a, a strong patriotism to the government rather than a strong ideal of freedom. So the one is always there, but the government, the federal government for roughly 100 years is seen primarily as an enemy, at least in their experience. So, uh, Thank you both so much for the presentations. I'm curious about when you described the Latter-day Saint refusal to celebrate the 4th of July as a kind of silent protest. It made me think of contemporaneously statements from, say, Frederick Douglass, like what is the 4th of July to a black man in America, and even reaching into our present, um, some athletes who kind of don't, who sort of re refrain from uh, national anthem participation. In what way, I is, this, is this too big a picture to, con to bring all together, or is there anything, any through line that you would Le that you would say ties them, whether whether with to each other or in the imagination of the American majority. That's that's a great question. I mean, I, I, obviously, uh, the persecution the Latter Day Saints faced then, and the horrors of of slavery and bigotry perpetrated against uh, African Americans is they're not comparable in that regard. So certainly not in regard to the heinousness of the crimes and the perpetuity of them and and the amounts of them they're, they're not similar but uh, I, I do think that it is certainly worth a it's worth reflection now let me speak personally rather than as a historian which means now I'm not an expert at all or I wasn't even before uh, and and that is that the I think that the knee-jerk reaction from people who are in the majority, whether that be culturally, racially, that the knee-jerk reaction is when someone appears to protest an aspect of that culture that they are attacking them personally and, that they, that, and they take it in a very personal way. And, and you can understand why someone might take someone kneeling at the national anthem that way you know perhaps they have uh, a loved one or themselves fought for the for the country and those are the same kinds of things that are at play then i mean some of the responses to the lack of of proper mormon patriotism is from people that well i've served in the war of 1812 and you know that kind of thing um but at the same time uh i, I think it is a an unwinnable argument for a persecuted and hated minority group. If you say nothing, then the behavior doesn't change at all. If you protest in a way that's in any way recognizable, well then 
you're a real problem because you hate the culture. And, and I think that Latter-day Saints face this unwinnable argument. We were as patriotic as we could possibly be. We're inviting every single person there. As, as, as John Taylor says, you took our cannons away from us. You came and confiscated them. And now you're wondering why we're not shooting off a cannon in the city. You have it. You took the cannon. Uh, and so I, I, think, I think that's something that I, I hope people can, can reflect on. Um, when you are in a persecuted minority group, you often have very few effective ways of protest. And the Latter-day Saints learned that over the course of uh, not only that decade, but the rest of the century. So. Okay, any last questions? Doesn't appear. So let's give them one more round of applause for, applause for these excellent presentations. <laughs>